Welcome to Obesity Forum Frequently Asked Questions, Obesity Unplugged, Your Questions, Our Answers. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Kushner. I'm a professor of medicine and medical education, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. And today I am honored to be joined by Dr. Donna Ryan, who's a professor emerita from Pennington Biomedical Research Center, Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Welcome, Donna. Oh, thank you for having me, Bob. So today we're going to discuss topics related to the questions we hear most about, from the provision of obesity care in the primary care setting to the latest clinical evidence for non-pharmacologic treatment and pharmacologic treatment of people living with overweight obesity. You know, firstly, Don, I have to say I am very excited to have you with us today. We've known each other for a long time, and I really can't think of anyone better suited for today's podcast. Our listeners may not know that Dr. Ryan is past president of the Obesity Society and the World Obesity Federation, a trialist in many of the landmark studies that we all know about, such as the Diabetes Prevention Program, or DPP, and Look Ahead, co-chair of the 2013 Obesity Guidelines, and currently co-chair of the Select Steering Committee, a study that we will talk about a little bit later. Donna, I am, again, so happy you're here today with us, and I want to go ahead and get started. Oh, Bob, it's my very great pleasure to be here. So, Donna, let's start with some broad questions. Currently, about 40% or so of the U.S. adult population has obesity uh, by body mass index. Now, that's a lot of patients that are being seen in the primary care office who are living with overweight or obesity. So here's the question, Donna. How should a primary care professional identify the high-risk patient who would benefit most from treatment? Well, the BMI is a good place to start. You know, it's coming in in your electronic health record at every visit. So it's really good on a population basis, and we love it for surveillance because we can track what's happening to the body weight status over time. But on an individual basis, it's not entirely accurate. So we start with the BMI. It's a great screener. And then we want to know if does that patient have excess abnormal body fat that's driving risk or driving disease. And the way, the first step in determining that is a waist circumference. So if your your patient has a BMI of 35 or less, get a waist circumference. It's gonna tell you where that body fat is located. And so you can have a person with a BMI of 30 and a waist circumference, if it's a male, they could be 38, 39. That is not excess body fat. That is somebody who's got excess muscle mass. So the cut point for waist circumference is 40 for men and 35 for women. And then we want to look at all of the complications of obesity, the risk factors, the usual risk factor profile, cardiometabolic risk factors, glycemic uh, risk factors, lipids, blood pressure, et cetera. It's really a case of identifying who needs treatment from excess abnormal body fat. That's the real definition of obesity. Good. So take a good history and physical exam, as you talked about, BMI is a good starter, waist circumference, look at the medical problems, and that's who you focus in on. We certainly don't want to treat everyone with a BMI over 30, right? That's that's too many people and they don't need treatment. So Donna, we clearly need to increase the workforce uh, of professionals who are, are evaluating, assessing, and treating obesity. What do you think are the biggest barriers to effective obesity management today in the primary care office, and, and how, how do we begin to overcome them? Well, number one is cost. You know, primary care physicians are not sure that they're going to get their services reimbursed if they code for obesity, and that's a darn shame. So we need to change that. That needs to happen. Uh, the medications that are used right now, some of the more effective medications, are extremely costly. So we must solve the cost problem. Um, you know, I think the uh, Affordable Care Act went a long way in assuring that patients could get treated uh, for the counseling part of weight management. And we need to continue. We need to continue with our bipartisan efforts to assure that there's transparency in drug pricing and that we we can bring these drugs within the reach of our patients, our patients who need them. So that's number one, it's cost. Number two is an educated workforce. So often uh, physicians are not taught about obesity in medical school, in their training or their residencies. One good thing about the primary care physicians is that they are taught about behavioral counseling. And that is really where we begin in our treatment for obesity. 
Yeah, do you think they have the resources they need, like access to uh, camera-ready handouts, registered dietitian? I always talk about obesity being a team sport. Uh, that you can't, you don't have to tackle it all yourself. Uh, do you think they're well-equipped in the primary care setting to handle obesity? Well, some, but they're the ones who've sort of pre-thought this, and they're rare. You know, yeah, so yes, that is exactly what needs to happen. We need to make the, the process for helping patients manage their weight much more efficient. It's uh, extremely difficult to do, and it's not really cost effective to do it on a one-on-one -on -one counseling basis and try to fit it into that 15-minute slot with a doctor seeing the patient. We need to come up with better strategies. One strategy I particularly like has been piloted by the Cleveland Clinic, and that, that is the shared medical appointment. So what this does is it gives patients who participate an hour or more of time where we can actually achieve some good things in terms of counseling around obesity and its treatment. Mm -hmm. If we're able to empower the primary care professionals, that workforce at tier one, let's say, where patients are coming into a healthcare system or to a private office, and they're being evaluated and hopefully getting started in obesity care, do you have a thought of when should a patient be referred up to a, a specialty clinic? You know, there's now over 8,000 uh, diplomats in American Board of Obesity Medicine and continuing to grow. So we're having the healthcare systems populated with these obesity centers, but we can handle all these patients. So if you were designing or, or developing a, a new specialty clinic and healthcare system, what kind of patients should they be seeing given 40% of American adults uh, suffer from obesity? Yeah, it does take some, some a skill set to be good at managing obesity. And the, what the ABOM uh, course does and their certification is it really gives physicians the background and, and education and training to get to that level. You know, so um, I think one thing that could happen is in multi-specialty clinics and especially clinics where there are more than one primary care physician that you could identify one who could become an expert and then the problematic patients could be referred to that one and that person could also have the role of educating his colleagues peer-to-peer -peer education about how to do this but clearly there are more complicated cases patients who have eating disorders perhaps patients who have the rare genetic obesities patients who have extremely high BMIs. You know, we're seeing, we already have 9% of the adult population with a BMI over 40. And there's a significant number of people who have a BMI over 60. I think those BMI over 60 patients should be in a specialty care setting. Yeah, I agree with you. I would probably lower that, potentially lower that threshold to maybe 40 or 50 or so. Also, uh, I love this term multimorbidity, which is being floated around the literature. And I would say someone, patient with a Beast with multimorbidity, a lot of uh, de you know, a lot of medical problems that need to be dealt with, perhaps with that team approach that's baked into these specialty clinics as well, and bariatric surgical candidate, of course. Exactly, exactly. Very good, Bob. Don, let me switch to medications because that's really a hot topic, and um, there, a lot of those frequently asked questions are coming in on it. And if you look at a package insert, Donna, the gateway to a medication is BMI, really, BMI 30 or 27 or more with a comorbidity. But that really just scratches the surface. We don't treat everyone just based on BMI. You made that point earlier very well. What other factors should the primary care professional consider when they're thinking about, are you, is this patient a good candidate for medication? This is difficult. Of course, you know, we're all taught First of all, do no harm. So there are instances where we absolutely do not want to prescribe a particular medication to a patient. For example, a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer. No GLP-1 medication. That's a contraindication. Similarly, we want to avoid these medications. For example, uh, the combination fitramine topiramate. We don't want to use that in, in women who could become pregnant because the topiramate is associated with cleft palate. So number one, we want to exclude medications from considerations where there's a real you know, contraindication. Number two, we want to try to get the most bang from our buck with these medications. And some of them have dual actions. So for example, we can get glycemic benefit as well as weight loss with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So terzepatide and semaglutide and loraglutide would be a good choice there. Um, and, and, and similarly, 
Um, you know, other medications can have other effects that are sort of dual benefits. So, for example, that fentramine topiramate might be a good choice for a patient who has migraine headaches because topiramate is used frequently for migraine prevention. So I think the number one, exclude patients who, in which is a con contraindication. Number two, seek dual benefits. And then we start looking at can the patient afford the medication? Is it going to be covered by their insurance? How much is their copay going to be and such? Yeah, so a lot, lot of things are going on in the head of prescriber. Bottom line, I always say is patients don't have to earn the right to get a medication. Uh, it's really, if you're a good candidate for it, let's see how uh, which one we can choose and, and help that patient out. With these new medications, and everyone's aware of them now around the country, around the world probably, you know, how effective these medications are now. A lot of people are asking, do I really still need to talk about and counsel on lifestyle? Can't medications take us all the way down the road and get to where we need to be? What, do you, what are your thoughts about the concomitant or adjunctive lifestyle medicine that goes with it? Yeah, you know, Bob, I see these medications as a window of opportunity. They open that window of opportunity to get that patient to a healthier diet and a healthier physical activity pattern. Yeah, they're going to produce weight loss because they're going to affect appetite. But the window of opportunity is to try to take advantage of the qualities in the diet and the qualities in the lifestyle that can have independent health benefits. So when patients start losing weight with these medications, they're often motivated to make dietary changes. They're not as attracted to the old trigger foods that they used to be uh, interested in, and they feel better about themselves, and they hopefully will want to do more in the physical activity realm. Because, you know, diet quality and fitness both bring health benefits that are independent of body weight. Yeah, good point. Good, good point. I'm glad, glad you brought brought that up. Patients are actually maybe more likely to actually hear your counseling advice and adhere to it with the medication. So I agree completely. Now, I mentioned earlier that you are co-chair of the Select Steering Committee, which really is a landmark study. And I had the honor of being on that steering committee with you as well. And I know we don't have a lot of time uh, during the podcast, but I wonder if you can just briefly uh, tell us why it's considered a landmark study and what have we learned from it? Oh, yeah, Bob. You know, I wish I had mentioned this when I talked about selecting a medication for a dual benefit. This study shows that one of our weight loss medications can prevent heart attack, it can prevent stroke, and it can prevent sudden death in people who are at very high risk for that, people who've already had established cardiovascular disease. So it's patients who've had a heart attack, a stroke, or who've had uh, symptomatic peripheral artery disease who were in this study. None of them had diabetes, and they were 45 years or older. So it's a little different population that we're used to seeing in our, our weight management studies. More men, about 75% were men. The average age was about 62. But what this study showed was in this group of patients who were already receiving pretty good preventive care for secondary prevention of heart disease, they had a 20% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. This is a landmark because it's the first time we've actually shown that our treatments for obesity can modify a disease. This is much more than just mediating risk factors or these intermediate measures of a disease. This actually modifies a disease. And in that, it legitimizes the field. It makes what you and I do every day something that people need to to recognize it's not just, we're not just playing around with improving some numbers, we are saving lives. So the good thing about this study is, is that it really for the first time got Medicare and Medicaid, our government insurances, interested in paying for an obesity treatment. And Medicare has announced that they will pay for the indication of semaglutide in secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And it's happening in my state, it's happening in Texas. I hope it's happening in Illinois in your state. So, yeah, so that's a big deal. You know, we've never really had Medicare and Medicaid reimburse regularly for our obesity treatments. This is the first. And the reason is, it's because it modifies the disease. It saves lives. Yeah, truly a landmark study. I'm so glad you had a chance to go over that with everyone. That's something, a study everyone needs, I think, to be aware of. 
Donna, the other, uh, th another question that often comes up, at least when I'm uh, talking to other professionals, is what's going on here? I is it because these drugs are so effective in losing weight, 15% with, with semaglutide and 20% on average with uh, terzepatide? Is it the weight loss that's driving these outcomes or are there more weight independent effects? We call them plea plea uh, trophic, right? Effects beyond weight loss. So what, what do we know about that? Yeah, well, I'm gonna give you the answer first and then I'm gonna tell you why. So the answer is, is both. You know, so there are benefits of weight loss. Look, it improves glycemia, it improves lipids, it improves blood pressure. All of those things are drivers of cardiovascular disease. But, you know, when we do the analyses in the select trial, when we look at weight loss in the first 20 weeks, does that, do the people who don't lose 5% in the first 20 weeks, do they still have these MACE benefits? Yes, they do, Bob. So, so the effects of MACE are independent of weight loss. They're independent of the glycemic effects. They, those things help, but the effect of the drug is more than that. It's those pleiotrophic effects. Maybe the anti-inflammatory effects could be driving this. There are other proposed mechanisms by which the maglutide may be doing this. The important thing to remember is it pretty much doesn't matter. Everybody can get benefits of weight loss beyond cardiovascular risk reduction, and they can get the cardiovascular risk reduction too. All right, so stay tuned. Very good answer to that uh, that we don't we don't know, but but it looks like it's both, right? You're saying. Don, another common um, question, I would actually say probably the most common question patients ask when they, uh, when you're having a discussion with them about using these medications is, do I need to take it the rest of my life? That, that's so common. And so it's a two-part question. You One is, what, what do you tell those patients? What's your answer? And the other part of it is, is, are there any studies going on, or is it just the art of medicine at this point of how to either maintain or don't maintain patients on these medications? What kind of strategies are we looking at? Yeah, I think people really don't want to take medications for a lifetime. We've shown that with our blood pressure and our lipid medicines. There are two two reasons why uh, people might be taking these medicines currently. Well, actually three. One is diabetes control, one is weight loss, and one is, is the cardiovascular risk reduction. If you're taking this medication for cardiovascular risk reduction, you need to stay on it. If you're not on the medication, you're not going to have that benefit. And the same thing with diabetes. I mean, we don't really want people to stop these medications because they will lose that glycemic benefit. Well, why would weight be different than that, Bob? You know, it, people, when people lose weight, they feel wonderful. They feel like, I got this. I know what to do now. I don't need this medicine anymore. But we know from our studies, when we stop the medication, we see weight regain occurring. Now, does it recur in every single person? Probably not. There's probably a subgroup of patients who are able to stop the drug and keep their weight off, but it's small. It's, it's, we don't know how big it is and, and we need to study that. So for now, what I can say is if you continue the medication, as long as you're on it, your weight will stay down. You will, be, you will maintain the weight you've lost. What we don't know completely is what happens when you stop it to wait. So yeah, we need to study that. I think that there may be slightly different mechanisms with losing weight and the physiology of maintaining weight. So I think there is room for study. There is room for research and different approaches to weight loss maintenance. And there are some of these underway in younger people. You know, we don't want to do this in older people who are taking it for cardiovascular risk reduction, but for younger people who've got 50, 60, 70 years of life left to live, are there things we can do that would, we may not have to give these medicines for life? That's an important area of research. So keep asking that question, Bob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think things that, that clinicians are doing, although to underscore what we just said, we don't have the research, is could they do better on a lower dose? Uh, could we switch to, let's say, a lower cost medication? You brought up cost, which was very true. Maybe a lower cost oral medication if there isn't a contraindication, or maybe uh, intermittent therapy. So that's, that falls, in my mind, under the art of medicine. But to underscore what you said, we don't have the research at this point. That's having, I think, a shared decision-making discussion with the patient uh, and say, what is it you would like to do? Here's my opinion. This is the information I have for you. What, what are your thoughts and values? Donna, just before I get to the last question, uh, which is kind of that forward-looking question, I want to uh, maybe uh, get your thoughts on what can clinicians do 
to help patients stay on the medication, because we know you, you made that point very well. If you have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, you need to stay on it. Uh, particularly during that dose escalation phase, what, what, what can we do to help patients reduce those side effects and stay on the medication? I think we really have to educate our patients about how these medications work. They delay emptying of the stomach. They also will have effects uh, on, um, you know, appetite and thirst. So we need to let our patients know in advance this is ha going to happen and that they should not try to eat their regular meal. They have to eat a smaller meal. They have to eat different foods. You cannot have those energy dense, rich foods because I guarantee you, if you have a big plate of lasagna and top it off with some chocolate cake, you will have nausea and vomiting after this drug is given. So we've got a, you know, a lot of, a lot of prevention uh, can really pay off here. And, and if patients aren't prepared for that, they can get in trouble. So yeah, and then there are home remedies to help with nausea and vomiting. If patients have to have anesthesia, they should be on clear liquids for at least 24 hours in advance. You know, because the delay in gastric emptying, it, you know, it doesn't go away rapidly. The anesthesiologists like to stop these drugs for two weeks, but you still have, uh, after two weeks, you will still have some of the molecules circulating in your body. So what you really wanna do is have the stomach empty for your anesthesia. And the best way to do that is clear liquids 24 hours in advance. So tips like that, if patients have GERD, it's gonna get a little worse because of that delay in gastric emptying. And we need to be proactive about that. Give patients antacids, proton pump inhibitors, things like that. Yeah, agree completely. Bottom line, don't just write the prescription and say, see in three months, right? Be prepared to hold the hand of the patient and communicate with them with touch points uh, that, that are frequent. Donna, the last question is one of these forward-looking questions. You you have your, pul your finger on the pulse of obesity. You're incredibly well connected and, and involved in uh, a lot of what's going on in the studies. So what does that look like? If you're, you're looking two to five years out, what does that look like uh, along the landscape for obesity care? Yeah, I think in five years, we will have many more drugs available to us. You know, the ones that are likely to be out on the market in five years are a triple agonist and a combination of a GLP-1 agonist with a long acting analog and an oral GLP-1 and a medication that is appears to be specific for clearing the liver of fat and may have effects on MASH and even the fibrosis in the liver. You know, a lot of compounds that are very interesting. There's one that will be given monthly and that one is a monoclonal antibody. So that'll be interesting too. So oral medications, monthly treatment, more spe specific uh, indications around diseases. I think this, uh, the disease modifying properties of these drugs is something that we'll learn a lot more about. Maybe these drugs are effective in addiction, in smoking cessation. Maybe these drugs will work to help with neuroinflammation, with Parkinson's disease, and with cognitive dysfunction. Those studies are underway right now. So we have a lot of drugs in, in phase three already, and we've got a lot of studies underway to look at how these drugs can benefit patients. The other thing that's gonna happen, and you'll, I, I'm gonna put my reputation behind this, these drugs are gonna be affordable. We absolutely must solve this problem. There's no way that we can have a discovery that has the implications that these GLP-1 medications have and not act on it to help our patients. So there's gonna be a lot more transparency about pricing and there's gonna be a lot more competition. The prices are gonna go down. And I believe we're gonna have solved the problem of access, both on the cost and the delivery of the drugs to the drug stores. Very good. A lot, very exciting time. I love your comments regarding the economics of obesity. We've got to solve this cost problem to get them into the arms, if you will, or mouths, if it's an oral medication of the patients that we care for. Don, this has been a wonderful, informative podcast. It's been just a delight to have you on. I hope our listeners learned a little bit more about the frequently asked questions. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm honored to be here, Bob. Thank you.